Hare Krishna. For the last two mornings, we have been speaking about Sanatan Goswami. On the first day, which was his disappearance day, we spoke a bit about his glories. And yesterday we began a discussion on the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Sanatan Goswami, celebrated amongst the Gaudiya Vaishnavas as Sanatan Shiksha. These teachings comprise almost five chapters of the Chaitanya Charita Amrita. And it is not possible, as I mentioned yesterday, to discuss all these five and even to discuss one chapter in totality in, in these two sessions is difficult. But we began the discussion of the 20th chapter yesterday and we'll continue with that and hopefully we'll be able to summarize this chapter today. So, as I mentioned yesterday, this chapter can be roughly divided into some portions. The first part is where Mahaprabhu speaks about the constitutional position of the living entity including its liberated state and the bound state and also he mentions the process of deliverance of the jiva from bondage. The second part of, the te of this chapter deals with the way of devotional service Specifically, Mahaprabhu explains the three terms Sambandha, Abhidheya and Prayojan and illustrates it with a beautiful allegorical story or a metaphor or a parable about Sarvagya, the astrologer and the treasure. And next he is going to speak about the description of the Absolute Truth and his numerous forms. So we'll begin from here. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that actually there are three great riches, Teen Mahadhan. And in case we think those three riches are pound, shillings and pence, uh, Mahaprabhu defers and says the three great treasures are Krishna, Krishna Bhakti and Prema. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna Bhakti means devotional service to Krishna and Prema means love of Godhead. So corresponding to the three stages, Sambandha, Abhidheya and Prayojana. And he says in all the revealed scriptures, Krishna is the be all and the end all. He is the beginning, he is the middle, he is the end. The conclusion and the purpose of all the Vedic scriptures is to know Krishna and to love him. He also mentions a verse from the Padma Puran in which the commonly asked question is addressed that there are so many different Vedic scriptures and some of them glorify a particular demigod and other scripture glorifies another demigod and it all gets very confusing. Who is the Supreme? How do we understand? So in this verse of the Padma Puran quoted by Mahaprabhu, he says that there are many Vedic literatures and in each of them there are particular demigods who are spoken of as chief demigods. This is just to create an illusion for moving and non-moving living entities. Let them perpetually engage in such imaginations. However, those who analytically study the literatures come to the conclusion that it is only Lord Vishnu O Lord Krishna, who is the one and only Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, rather strong words. So those descriptions of particular demigods being the Supreme that are mentioned in certain scriptures are illusions only. So why? Why create such an illusion? Because the worshippers of those demigods need faith. In order to do some form of worship, you must have some faith. And to bolster that faith, you need to glorify that particular worshipable deity. So because these particular worshippers want some material benefits from such worship as part of the Karmakanda process, that faith is fostered 
by such uh, fanciful descriptions of their glories as ultimate uh, entities. But ultimately, actually, for a discerning and analytical student of the Vedas, it becomes clear that Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna is the conclusion ultimately. Whether one takes to the process directly, indirectly, whether one interprets it in this way or that way, ultimately it's all about Krishna. Then Mahaprabhu begins a description of the Absolute Truth, mentioning that actually Krishna is the ultimate Absolute Truth. He is the Ashraya Tattva. Tattva means the truth or the principle. And there are two words that are very important here, Ashraya and Ashrita. Ashraya means shelter. Ashrita means that which has taken shelter or which is under the shelter of something else, of the Ashraya. So let us remember these two words, Ashraya Tattva and Ashrita Tattva. So the truth who is a shelter of everything and Ashrita is everything else that is under the shelter of this Supreme Truth. So in the Srimad Bhagavatam there are ten subjects and the ultimate subject is Ashraya Tattva. That's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The first nine take shelter of the tenth one. Atra Sarga Visargascha Sthanam Poshanam Utayaha Manmantaresha Anukatha Nirodha Mukti Rashrayaha so these ten topics are discussed in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The first nine are under the shelter of the tenth, Ashrayaha. And that is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, who is the complete absolute truth. So, Ashrit Ashraya Vigraham. So he is the form of Ashraya, Ashraya Vigraha. He is not formless. He has a form, an ultimate spiritual form. And that form is described in the verse that we just recited today. Beautiful verse. It explains everything about Krishna's transcendental form. That that form is the source of everything. That form is the sum total of everything. That form is of a supreme youth. That form is composed of spiritual bliss. That form is a shelter of everything and that form is a master of everyone. So the Absolute Truth has a form. That form is unlimited. I was discussing this also with some devotees yesterday. How can a form said to be unlimited? Generally, when we think of form, there is a limit. This, mic this microphone has a form, it's limited. Our bodies have a form, it's limited. So therefore, because everything in our experience is limited, we superimpose our limited, the conceptions born of our limited experience on the Lord and posit that the Lord also must be limited. But the Lord can't be limited. Therefore, we say, they say that God can't have a form. That is the way they reconcile this. But Vaishnava philosophy is that indeed God cannot be limited but the mistake the Mayavadis make is that they think that the Lord's form is material but that is not the case the Lord's form is spiritual completely spiritual Chidananda Deha he has a form that is composed of spiritual bliss and because it's composed of spiritual substance that form has no limit. And as we will see shortly, one of the reasons for uh, terming the Lord's form as unlimited is that He can expand Himself into unlimited forms equal to Himself. In that sense, we can understand that the form of the Lord is unlimited. Limited forms of the Lord cannot, are not limited. Uh, our forms cannot expand unlimitedly. Another reason for saying that the Lord's form is unlimited is that that one form can not only expand quantitatively into many forms, 
but that one form can also expand unlimitedly to whatever an unlimited extent and it can also contract to an unlimited extent. So the Lord appears as Mahavishnu who is gigantic and he, the same form can come into an atom and be smaller than an atom. This is the meaning of unlimited form. And not only is he unlimited in space, he is also unlimited in time. All other forms, all material forms are subject to the deteriorating or degrading influence of the time factor. But not so with Krishna's body. Krishna's body is never affected by time. He is the master of time. So there is no question of Krishna becoming old, having white hair, a bent body with a walking stick, as is the case with us. So in this way we see that even though the Absolute Truth has a form, He is still unlimited. Therefore there is no contradiction between the Lord being unlimited and Him having a form. Rather, these two are, more, are reconciled in a most sublime way in the Personality of Krishna, the Supreme Absolute Truth. And Mahaprabhu quotes some famous verses like the Brahma Samhita verse, Ishvara, Paramaha, Krishna, etc. We all know these verses. And then he speaks about how that one Supreme Absolute Truth is understood in three aspects as Bhagavan, Paramatma and Brahman. Brahman is the impersonal light, spiritual light. And most people who believe in God, in general, their conception of God is this impersonal aspect. If you look at it, study uh, the different conceptions of God all over the world. Mostly it is like that. Even in the Vedic conception of God, it is mostly like that. They believe in the impersonal aspect of the Absolute. It is only the Vaishnavas who believe or understand and know that the Absolute Truth is ultimately a person. And there are amongst other religious denominations few who also accept that God is a person. Shri Shri Radha Gokulananda ki jai, Shri Shri Gaurnitai ki jai, Shri Shri Sita Ram Lakshman Harman ki jai. So Brahman is the Absolute Truth, but not the complete Absolute Truth. Higher than Brahman, is a localized aspect of the Absolute Truth who exists in the heart of every living entity and within every atom. And ultimately the source of the Brahman and the Paramatma, Bhagavan, who is Sri Krishna, who is described in the verse that we just recited some time ago. So one who understands Bhagavan understands automatically Paramatma and Brahman. And the example that Srila Prabhupada gives elsewhere is of the sun god, the sun globe and the sun rays. Understanding the sun rays to be the sun is not wrong, but it is an incomplete understanding. Understanding the sun globe to be the sun along with the sun rays is also correct but not complete. Our understanding is complete when we understand that the totality of the sun comprises the sun god, the sun globe and the sun rays. In the same way the complete conception of the Absolute Truth is when we understand Krishna as Bhagavan, his expansion as super soul as a localized feature and the bodily spiritual effulgence as Brahman. And then Mahaprabhu says that these three aspects of the Absolute Truth are understood by three types of yogis. The Jnana yogis aspire for the understanding of the Lord as Brahman. The Ashtanga yogis aspire for understanding the Lord as a super soul in the heart. Dhyana vasthita tadkatena manasa pashyantiyam yoginaha. And the devotees, the blissful devotees like yourselves, they aspire to understand the absolute truth in the original form as a Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. 
वदन्ति Brahmeti Paramatmeti Bhagavan Iti Shaktyate. So this is the famous verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam which is cited to illustrate the three aspects of the Absolute Truth. Mahaprabhu describes these three a little bit and then he goes on to talk about three principal forms of the Absolute Truth. Okay. We have some nice scenery here. One second, I think we'll just keep the suspense a little longer. <laughs> we'll reveal it at one time. There's something mind-boggling that's going to come up on the screen in just a short while. So those of you who are preparing to sleep, wake up. <laughs> and pinch yourself to stay awake because what you're going to see is something that even yogis and jnanis after millions of births don't understand. And even we struggle to understand this as devotees because this description is, is somewhat confusing and very, very elaborate. The one Supreme Lord who expands into unlimited forms, so many different categories of expansions is mind-boggling. Now generally people who are not familiar with the devotional philosophy, they allege that we are polytheists. You know, there are different types of theists and atheists. Maybe someday we'll have another class on that topic. But polytheists are those who believe in many gods. So because we apparently have so many types of gods, so people say, you people are also polytheists. You tell them, no, 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 there's a difference between the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the demigods. There are others who are demigods like Indra, Chandra, Varuna, etc. They are not God with a capital G. They are God with small g. So we call them demigods. They are empowered by the Supreme Lord. They are not independent powers. It is only God with a capital G who is the original, ultimate, absolute truth. These others with a small g are his limbs, his parts and parcels, who are dependent upon the God with a capital G. So we cross one hurdle with that explanation. But some of them are a little more discerning. And they say, well, okay, I've got that point. But still you people have many gods. <coughs> Even let's understand you keep aside the demigods for the time being. But you have Ram and Krishna, Narasimha, Vamana, Matsya, Vishnu, Narayana. It's just mind-boggling. You're still polytheists because you have so many gods. So what would our answer be? No, we are monotheists. We believe in one God. And modern-day uh, religious scholars they have a certain term for it. Do you know what the term is? How do modern day religious scholars describe our theology or theological understanding of God? Anyone knows the term? Exactly. Okay, you'll get some Mahaprasadam plate at the end. <laughs> so modern day religious scholars, they define our theological understanding in this one term polymorphic monotheism. So it is monotheism. Mono means single or one. Theism is belief in God. So we believe in a single God, but it's qualified by the word polymorphic. Poly means many. Morphic means forms. So we have this one God, the one absolute truth, who can manifest himself in many forms. So the fact that he has many forms doesn't go against his unitary feature, his being one. It doesn't militate against the oneness of that absolute truth. So we are monotheists, but to borrow the term from these modern scholars, we are polymorphic monotheists. So will you remember that word? And the next time someone asks you something and you want to dazzle the person a little bit, <laughs> you know, you want to impress that person that you're very scholarly, just, you know, you say, look, you believe in many gods, just throw this term. No, we are polymorphic monotheists. 
and then he's going to ask, what's that? And then you can begin to talk and then you explain. And if he has the time and the energy, you can explain this particular chart that we're going to show you. Krishna Mahaprabhu says that the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna manifests himself in three principal forms. The Supreme Personality of Godhead exists in three principal forms called Swayam Rupa, Tad Ekatma Rupa and Avesha Rupa. Okay, so I think it's time to reveal the suspense now. <laughs> Here is a chart. I hope all of you can see it. Is there, can we raise the yeah. screen? I mean, because I think people at the back may not be able to see it. Oh, it's too small. Can we expand it? Is, is there a way to keep it on some table or something so everyone can see it? May I request some nice devotees to please get us a table from somewhere so that we can place the screen on a table? Is that possible? Can we expand it further? Can you all see this? Oh. Mm. So, what do we do? Some of, your, some of our uh, technical wizards can come and do something. Okay, even that's good. Yeah, that's a good idea. Very creative. Yeah, we can bring two chairs. What we can do is, we can turn it around and rest the screen on the chairs like that. Yeah, the other way. Yes. Yes. And you'll have to be a little careful when you lift the screen from the bottom. Yes. Okay, you may have to readjust the projector. Can we bring it a little ahead here? The, the chairs. We may have to adjust the projector. If you take it back, perhaps it may be bigger. many of you still won't be able to read the fine print. Okay, so what I may need to do is to maybe, is there a, a long stick or something? <laughs> Just point out. We don't beat anybody here. No. Some stick. Oh, I should have brought my sannyas danda. I could have done yeah. Practical. No, I'll have to point out. Uh, we have nothing here, right? Some stick, okay. Oh, that's good. That's good. Now these descriptions, when you actually read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, they can get a little confusing and it's a little complex, quite complicated to figure it all out. But I think this chart does a good job. So originally, Swayam, Swayam means self, original. So the form of Krishna that does not depend on any other form is called Swayam Rupa. Uh, do you mind if I we keep the computer here so I can because I can't see this clearly. It won't reach. 
Yeah. 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 No, it's the screen. There's something else on the screen. So the form of Krishna that does not depend on any other form, which is the original form. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. There we are. <laughs> Although it's not nice to point a stick at Krishna, but uh, I hope you understand it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, this here is Swayam Rupa. Swayam Rupam is the original form of Krishna that doesn't depend on any other form. It doesn't expand from any other form. Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam. Yeah, there's a famous verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And in the Swayam Rupa, Krishna is a cowherd boy living in Vrindavan. This is the original form of Krishna. Yes? And especially, and we'll come to that at the end, but I don't know if you'll have the time, so I'll say it now. Krishna is a cowherd boy as an adolescent youth. Kaishora. Hmm? Pre-youth. So that is the Swayam Rupa. Now this Swayam Rupa again has two divisions. That's not mentioned here. One of those divisions again is Swayam Rupa and the other division is Swayam Prakash. That's here. So, this first category of Swayam Rupa again is that same Krishna of Vrindavan, the same as the original Swayam Rupa. And Swayam Prakash is also in the category of Swayam Rupa, but there are some changes. It is his own manifestation. From the Swayam Rupa, there are some manifestations. Those manifestations which are identical to him in every respect in terms of form, mood, mellow, everything, they are called Prabhava Prakash. And the examples of the Prabhava Prakash are the forms of Krishna who danced with the gopis in the Rasa Leela. So there were unlimited Krishnas because there were unlimited gopis. Many, many gopis danced with Krishna in the Rasa Leela. And Krishna expanded himself to be with every single gopi. So every gopi thought, it's only me who is with Krishna. So who are those forms of Krishna? Are they different from Krishna? Are they same as Krishna? So those forms of Krishna who are identical with the Swayam Rupa in every respect, in terms of every detail of the form, in terms of the mood, the emotion, etc., they are called Prabhava Prakash forms. Another example that Mahaprabhu gives is of the uh, expansions of Krishna in Dwarka. They are expansions from the Vrindavan forms, of course. But in Krishna, in Dwarka, Krishna had 16,108 queens. And he had one palace for each queen. And at any given time, he was simultaneously present in each of these 16,108 palaces with his queens. So, uh, it is, Srila Prabhupada mentioned, Mah Mahaprabhu also mentions, that each of these forms who expanded or manifested from the original form, they are not like the expanded forms of Saubhara Muni. You know, the yogis can also expand their bodies into eight forms or nine forms, like Saubhari Muni did. But those forms are limited. Those are material forms and there's a maximum of eight or nine forms into which such yogis can expand their bodies. But this expansion is not the same. Otherwise, Narad Muni would not have been so astonished to see these expansions. Narad Muni himself is a great yogi, he can expand himself. But when he saw these expansions of Krishna, he was astonished. So that is the Prabhava Prakash form of the Swayam Rupa. Yes. So these are the Swayam Prakash forms 
in the Prabhava. Prakash means a manifestation. So one category of the Swayam Prakash, which is his own manifestation, is the Prabhava Prakash. Forms identical to the original in every respect. Then there is the Vaibhava Prakash. Oops, what happened? It has got unmanifested. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's my laptop. <laughs> Can the owner of the laptop kindly manifest? <laughs> That's a nice road. <laughs> nice guy. Okay. So yeah, thank you. So the Vaibhava Prakash are also manifestations of the Swayam Rupa, but there is one form of feature that is differently manifested according to different emotional features. There is one thing about this, ex this manifestation that is a little different from the original form. Here, in the Prabhava Prakash, it's exactly identical. But here, there is one feature, one form, that is slightly different. And an example of this is Balaram. Balaram is also Swayam Rupa. But he is a Vaibhava manifestation of that Swayam Rupa. Meaning, there is one thing that is different between Balaram and Krishna. And what is that one thing? The complexion. Krishna is dark, Balaram is white. That's the only difference between Balaram and Krishna. No other difference. Because of the slight difference of mood, in terms of physical appearance, that's the only thing. So Balaram is an expansion, or, or rather is the um, Vaibhava Prakash aspect of the Swayam Prakash. Then we come to the uh, Tadekatma Rupa. The Tadekatma tade, Rupa are forms that exist simultaneously with the Swayam Rupa. They are also non-different from the Swayam Rupa. But they have specific bodily features and activities that appear to be different. In the Ras Leela, every aspect of Krishna's was the same. The activities were the same. All those forms of Krishna were doing the Ras Leela. In Dwarka, the various forms of Krishna were doing different activities at the same time, but they had the same mood, they had the same external appearance. Here, for the Tad Ekatma Rupa, these manifestations of the Swayam Rupa, they have different forms different modes, different emotions than the original. And they are divided into, so it says here, expansion with different modes and bodily features. And there are two categories here. One is called Swamsha, which are the personal manifestations of the Lord, partial manifestations, I beg your pardon. And you have the Vilas, which are the four-armed Vishnu forms. So let's talk about the Swamsha. Sva, means self. So, Amsha means a uh, part. So, the Swansha are those who are expansions of the personal potency of the Lord. They are partial manifestations of the Lord. And essentially, these are the six types of incarnations. The six categories of incarnations. What is the difference or the relationship between the two words expansion and incarnation. Who would like to shed some light? Expansion is the magnifying. Expansion is size, growth of size. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, someone who is, uh, yeah, anyone? Yes. Okay, expansions exist in the spiritual world 
and incarnations exist in the material world. So that means incarnations don't exist in the spiritual world? They do. Yes, Vishwamitra. Expansion when you expand. Yes. Yourself. Incarnation when you incarnated into a, another body. No. The Lord's body is always transcendental and eternal. Yes. I know it's, it's called incarnation, but it doesn't mean that, you know, it's made of car, you know, like yeah. material. Right. It's a very simple uh, distinction. The, the moot point that both of you have made is correct. They descend into the world. The difference between expansion and incarnation is that incarnations are those expansions that descend into the world. That's all. <laughs> Avatarati iti avataraha. Uh, uh, so those who descend, avatarati means to descend. So those forms or those expansions of the Lord, everyone except Krishna is an avatar. All the forms of Godhead except Krishna is avatar. Krishna is avatari, he's the source of all the avatars. But even when Krishna descends, he is also referred to as an avatar because he descends. So Krishna has innumerable, unlimited expansions in the spiritual world. And these are some of these expansions as and when they descend into the material world are called avatars. And there are also some avatars who may not exist in the spiritual world especially the Shakti Avesh avatar who are empowered living entities and we'll come to that. So that is a connection between the expansions and the avatars, right? Okay, so we have these six categories of avatars and I think we should memorize these six categories. We must know what these categories are, yes? The first are the Leela avatars. Those incarnations, the pastime incarnations of the Lord. Yes? Who descend. Can we increase the font size here? Who, whose it's computer is this? No? It's, it's a picture font. Yeah. So these are, the word Leela, as you know, indicates pastime. So these are all the, the uh, avatars of the Lord or the expansions of the Lord who descend into the world to perform pastimes and they're described in the scriptures as performing various types of pastimes. And by the way, sometimes these categories of avatars may overlap. So you may have a particular incarnation who may appear in more than one category of an incarnation. Your guna avatar is also a lila avatar like that, you see? So the Leela avatars, can you mention some of the Leela avatars? Lord Ram. Ram, Matsya, Kurma, Vamana. These are all the pastime incarnations of the Lord. Varaha, etc. So that's Leela avatar. Yes? The next are the Purusha avatars. Purusha avatars are those who are specifically connected to the material world. As I mentioned, there are some avatars who may not exist in the spiritual world. And uh, some do, mostly they do, but some don't. So the Purusha avatars are the Mahavishnu form of the Lord who lies in the causal ocean and from him emanate all the universes from the pores of his skin. As he breathes out, all the material universes move outwards. When he breathes in, all the universes come back within him. And into each and every universe, Mahavishnu expands himself to form Garbhodakashai Vishnus, as many Garbhodakashai Vishnus as there are universes. He fills half of each universal egg with his own transcendental perspiration, which is the Garbhodaka ocean. And then he lies down in that on Ananta, that is Garbhodaka Vishnu, Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu. Shai means to sleep. So he sleeps on the Garbha Udaka, the water of the universe. From the navel, 
from his navel comes a lotus. On top of that lotus is Brahma. And then again that Garbhodakashaya Vishnu expands himself to enter into each and every atom and into the heart of every living entity as the Kshirodakashaya Vishnu who also resides in the milk ocean within every universe. So naturally Kshirodakashaya Vishnu and Garbhodakashaya Vishnu uh, and Mahavishnu are specific features for in relation to this material world. <coughs> So then the next category is Guna Avatar. Guna Avatar, we have the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion and ignorance. And we have three empowered entities who are in charge of these three Gunas. So Lord Vishnu, who is transcendental in all circumstances, is in charge of the mode of goodness. That's the most difficult one to take charge of. It involves sustenance. The next one is Lord Brahma. He is generally speaking a jiva who uh, is empowered uh, to take charge of the mode of passion and engage in the task of creating the universe. And finally, there is that mysterious and uh, most uh, enchanting form of Lord Shiva who is neither a jiva nor a Vishnu Tattva. When the Supreme Lord Vishnu descends to come in contact with the material world for the purpose of destroying the world, then he's called Shiva. Shiva also has an important role in the creation of the whole material cosmos. So these are the guna avatars, guna meaning the modes of nature. Then you have the Shaktyavesh avatar. Yes, thank you. The Shaktyavesh avatars are avatars they are specifically empowered living entities who are representatives of the Lord. In the Shakti Avesh avatars also, there are two categories which are not shown here. Uh, that's the second category there. Just in this category avatar, one is called a Sakshad avatar or a direct avatar uh, who is actually the Supreme Lord himself. They are Vishnu Tattvas, like Ananta for example. Ananta is one who is the bed of Lord Vishnu or Shesha who serves Vishnu. So they are Saksha or direct Shakti Avesh avatars and they are Vishnu Tattva. However, there are also indirect uh, avatars, Shakti Avesh avatars who are living entities, Jivas and they are empowered by the Supreme Lord for certain specific purposes. The four Kumaras for example they have the Jnana Shakti, they are empowered with transcendental knowledge. Narada is empowered with Bhakti Shakti. Parushuram is empowered with Dushta Damana Shakti, the power to uh, subdue wicked people. We also have Prithu who has Prajapalana Shakti, the power to maintain the living entities. And we have, uh, who else, Prithu Maharaj, yes, Prajapalana Shakti and there are several others. Brahma is Srishti Shakti, the power to create the universe. So Brahma is a Guna Avatar, he is also a Shakti Avesh Avatar. And then there are others, a second category, another category of the Shakti Avesh Avatars, who are called Vibhutis, who are not as empowered as the Shakti Avesh Avatars. There is some degree of empowerment, but not as much. And these vibhutis are referred to by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Vibhuti Yoga. And some examples of these are Indra, Agni, Brihaspati, Kartikeya, Bhrigu, who are empowered with a slight a bit of some particular Shakti. Then you have the Manmantara avatars. Yes, they appear in each Manmantara. In every day of Brahma, there are how many Manus? 14 Manus. And in each Manu, Manu's lifespan, there are how many Chatur Yugas? Yes? 71. So 71 times 14 is roughly a thousand. So you have, you know, thousand Chatur Yugas in one day of Brahma. So we have 14 Manus, from the word Manu comes man, 
manushya all the words in the world that deal with man they come from this manu because we are all descendants of manu so in manu's duration there is one avatar we are presently in the seventh manvantara of this day of brahma who is our manu vaivasvata manu the son of the sun god and who is the manvantara avatar for our manvantara quiz samo mahaprasadam for anyone vamana dev vamana is the manvantara avatar for this manvantara so each manvantara has a specific form of the lord who takes charge of that manvantara so that is the manvantara avatar and finally we have the yuga avatar and they have different colors in satya yuga he is white in color in treta yuga he is red in dwapara he is blackish in kali he is yellowish or golden and this time chaitanya mahaprabhu has come as the yuga avatar chaitanya mahaprabhu doesn't come in every kali yuga he doesn't come in every manvantara he comes in the seventh manvantara once in a day of brahma in the 28th chatur yuga yes of that so this is the yuga avatar so in every yuga we have one particular avatar who comes so this refers to the swamsha the partial or the personal manifestations of the lord that's one category of the tad ekatma rupa and then we have the vilasa rupas the vilasa rupas refer to the four round forms of the lord and this has been described extensively by mahaprabhu here from balaram you know then there is sankarsha sankar dendara the chaturbhuj vasudev sankarsha pratyumna aniruddha they expand into another uh, quadruple sankarsha pratyumna aniruddha vasudev and it continues like this three times then mahavishnu comes along and all these forms each of them they further expand into three and totally these are 24 and they are called prabhava vilas we won't get into that it gets a little technical and there's further expansions and these 24 forms are identified according to the order in which the four um, paraphernalia of the lord are placed in the hands the four hands of these uh, four arm forms the corn shell the disc the lotus flower and the club so according to the order and sequence in which they are placed these na- these forms of the lord are named differently janardana vamana trivikrama shridhara etc and we recite these names when we put tilak every day in our body so these are the different forms of the lord and Uh, this is a rough schema schematic overview of uh, the different forms of the lord as instructed by mahaprabhu to sanatan goswami and he concludes by saying that the original uh, in goloka vrindavan as well krishna's form is most complete okay fine i think it's okay we we'll leave it in in uh, mathura and dwarka it is more complete in vaikuntha it is complete so there are degrees of completeness and perfection purna purnatara purnatama purna means complete purnatara means more complete purnatama means most complete so in vaikuntha the lord's form is complete purna mathura and dwarka is more complete purna tara and in goloka his form is most complete purna tama and he, even in goloka vrindavan in the purna tama form the original most beautiful and eternally existing form of the lord is as an adolescent youth the kauma of the the kishora when he descends into the material world as an avatar Krishna goes through 
the different ages of balya which means childhood pauganda which means boyhood kishora which means uh, pre youth or adolescent and once he reaches kishora he forever remains at that age because that age is his eternal age in goloka vrindavan he never grows beyond that in terms of his appearance so therefore as prabhupad says even on the battlefield of krishna when uh, of of kurukshetra beke padan when he was roughly 90 years old krishna looked like a youth of 16 yes so he grows till he's 16 till he looks like 16 and then he never grows in appearance after that so that is his eternal form in goloka vrindavan and that is the most worshipable form for us as followers of chaitanya mahaprabhu this is the most worshipable and attractive form of the supreme absolute truth krishna as a cowherd boy in his kaishora form eternally living in vrindavan moving with the cowherd boys frolicking with them grazing the cows dancing with the gopis being the pleasure of nanda maharaj and mother yashoda and the other prajapasis this is our worshipable lord aradhyo bhagavan prajesh tanayas tad dham vrindavanam ramya kachit upasana prajavatu vargena ya kalpita so and he is standing here today as gokula nanda So the perfection of our life is to become attracted to him and develop pure love for him. Thank you very much.